Hey squad, welcome back. This video is piggybacking off my recent video about magic words in Tolkien's Legendarium, which was almost 40 minutes long even after I excluded oaths and curses. Of course, if we're going to talk seriously about language and the supernatural in Middle-earth, we can't leave oaths out, since they give the Legendarium its very shape. Oaths, along with their counterpart curses, are a subset of language, and they are governed by the principles that describe language generally. Language is a kind of technology or supernatural technique itself, being more efficient and controllable than telepathy. Making a language is unique to incarnates, that is, the children of Eru, men, elves, and dwarves, whose life comes directly from the thought of Eru himself and not from the Valar, or as part of the theme. Language is therefore a sign of sentience and of having a soul. Eru's authorization that the world as described in the music of the Ainur exists in time and space is described in elven myth as the spoken command Ea. Fittingly, then, words have the most powerful effect when spoken by someone with the proper authority to affect the changes they want, to make an idea real. Finally, it's going to be relevant later on that while music is the preferred metaphor for the unified order that underlies the conditions of Arda's existence as given, the evolving history of Arda in time is conceived as a tale. The Valar have entered into this tale, and so have become like characters in it, even though most of them are more like NPCs than players. Eru, observing creation and time from the outside, is the author. Keeping that top of mind, let's discuss oaths. In most of our daily lives, we don't rely very much on oaths, so it's worth considering how they functioned historically. Brett Devereaux has a really useful exploration of this topic over on his blog. I'll include the link because it's well worth checking out if you're interested. According to Devereaux, oaths are a way of binding someone to their word when a simple promise is not enough. Oaths consist of a description of what the oath-taker intends to do, the more precise the better, along with naming a witness or power that will enforce the oath and the consequences that the taker will accept if he should break the oath. These consequences amounted to a curse that the oath-taker called upon themselves. In societies that lacked widespread literacy, a strong centralized government, and consistent law enforcement, oaths were what bound society together, from its political structure to its economy to just basic interaction within a community. You could maybe overlook slavery or child abuse in these societies, but not oath-breaking, and therefore the purely sociological penalties for breaking an oath would have been extreme – ostracism, exile, or even death. It didn't matter if you were breaking your oath for a really good reason or because of unforeseen circumstances, you were still bound by your words. Moreover, an oath implied a supernatural penalty for its breaking, and in societies that had a much deeper and more immediate relationship with religious or magical entities than we have today, these penalties would have been a serious deterrent. Even if we assume oaths didn't have any independent power to bind, psychologically they functioned as if they did. The emphasis on oaths and the importance of keeping one's word seems to have been one of the tropes from myth and legend, especially from the Norse and Anglo-Saxon traditions, that Tolkien particularly resonated with, since he goes out of his way to include many permutations of the idea in Middle-earth. Oaths reach the same level of cultural power, especially in the least modernized and most feudal societies in Middle-earth, like the Embattled the Dine of the First Age or the Rohirrim of the Third. In Hobbiton, where conditions are closest to our own, no one is swearing fealty to anyone, instead they're writing contracts signed in red ink and consulting family trees to determine inheritances. But Tolkien didn't stop there. Not only do oaths have a degree of cultural power, they also have an actual power to shape an oath-taker's fate. And under the right circumstances, the power they exert is second to nothing. The whole plot of the Silmarillion is essentially driven by the unbreakable oath of the Feanorians, and the souls of the dead men of Dunharrow are bound to Middle-earth until their oath is fulfilled, something that even the Valar do not have the authority to do. This is made doubly interesting by the fact that, unlike in actual history, in Middle-earth these oaths often don't name a specific supernatural power that they are sworn by. Elves and the most educated men know of Eru Iluvatar, but they very rarely pray to or even name him. Exceptions do of course exist, but they are notable for their incredible importance. Apart from the infamous case of Feanor and his sons, other known cases of the name of Eru being invoked to safeguard an oath are the alliance between Elendil and Gilgalad, the oath between Kirion and Eorl which is made on the mountain where Elendil's grave lies, and the renewal of that oath by Aragorn and Eomer. Even to name Eru is a significant act, regardless of whether you are swearing by his power. Tolkien notes that in Numenor, traditionally only the king may lawfully call upon Eru as witness, and then only on the most grave and solemn occasions. Though Kyrian, for instance, has the right to invoke the name as the king's steward, nonetheless his oath astounded those who heard it and filled them with awe, 
and was alone over and above the venerable tomb sufficient to hallow the place where it was spoken. In all these cases, the oath is considered unbreakable. We all know how the Feanorians turn out, Elendil and Gilgalad die fighting Sauron together, and there is no mention of Rohan ever letting Gondor down, but most of the time Eru is not named to ensure the oath is kept. Every so often, there is reference to the Valar, for instance, Feanor's oath not only calls upon Eru to hear it, but also upon Manwë and Varda from upon the holy mountain that is the seat of the Valar's authority to remember their words. Evil power can also be named to enforce an oath, as in Gollum's oath never to let Sauron have the ring, which he swears by the ring itself. Frodo points out that this is problematic. Just as the ring cannot be relied upon, neither can an oath sworn by its power. It will hold you, but it is more treacherous than you are. It may twist your words. Oaths can also be sworn upon holy or significant objects. Kyrion and Eorl swear while touching Elendil's tomb, and the dead men of Dunharrow are summoned to the Stone of Erech, a black stone brought from Numenor where their oath was originally sworn. This somehow gives additional force to the oath even though these objects, apart from being hallowed or blessed, don't seem to possess much inherent power. It's certainly not as though Eorl expects the tomb of Elendil itself to extract vengeance if he should break the oath he's taking on it. If I had to guess, I'd say that when Isildur hallowed the tomb of Elendil, he imbued it to a degree with the power of the Valar he entrusted it to. Thus, to swear on the stone, regardless of one's words, would carry close to the same weight as if one named the Valar as witness to the oath. I would further guess that something similar is at play with the Stone of Eric. If you twisted my arm, I might even suggest that a rock brought by the faithful from Numenor must have been very important. Maybe even a rock from the top of the Meneltarma, where the name of Eru was regularly invoked by the kings of Numenor. This is the only way I can see that the Oath of the Men of Dunharrow would have the power to bind their very souls beyond death, which again is something that even the Valar do not have the right to do. Certain gestures tend to accompany oaths, the Feanorians hold aloft their right hands when they swear, while Merry and Pippin lay their swords on their respective lieges' laps, but this varies according to circumstance and custom. The words people use to swear are also varied. On formal occasions, people will say that they are swearing or vowing something, and might go on to name a consequence or specify a limit. For example, Pippin's oath to Denethor, or more accurately, his oath to serve the state of Gondor through its representative Denethor, will stand until his lord release him, or death take him, or the world end. The stewards swear to serve Gondor until the king returns, a stock phrase that comes to mean forever in colloquial usage. Although even though no one expects the king to return, it is notable that the last ruling steward deserts his duty in spectacular fashion only as the king is indeed returning. The actual terms of an oath do count even if the taker isn't paying attention to them. But on the other hand, there are plenty of utterances, both formal and informal, that have the same binding power as an oath despite not including any reference to swearing as such. The members of the Fellowship are deliberately not placed under any oath. Elrond says that upon Frodo alone is any charge laid, yet Frodo considers himself bound by this charge despite never repeating any formal oath himself beyond his offer to take the ring at the end of the Council of Elrond. Sam likewise considers himself bound to accompany Frodo despite never undergoing any ceremonial acknowledgement of this, but he likewise speaks aloud his intent to accompany Frodo even after Frodo warns him that their quest is likely to turn out far more dangerous than they first guessed. If you don't come back, sir, then I shan't, that's for certain, said Sam. Don't you leave him, they said to me. Leave him, I said, I never mean to. I'm going with him if he climbs to the moon. The fact that any statement may have the binding power of an oath is a tenet that seems to be culturally enshrined in Gondor. Tested by Galadriel, Boromir brags that the men of Minas Tirith are true to their word. And later Faramir says, we are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We boast seldom and then perform or die in the attempt. Finally, while these specific words of an oath do matter, the spirit of the oath also matters. One still incurs penalties even if one has found a way to technically abide by the words of an oath while evading its original purpose. Thingol swears not to harm Baron, and then sends him on a suicidal quest, arguing that he is not doing anything to Baron, so he hasn't broken his promise. But not only does he lose his daughter to Baron after all, Baron does not die, and the Silmaril he brings back in fulfillment of his own oath brings doom to Thingol and ruin to his kingdom, and that's before the Sons of Feanor show up. Gollum thinks that because he's technically shown the hobbits a way into Mordor as they asked, technically not harmed Frodo directly, and by taking the ring will technically be keeping it safe from Sauron, he has found a way to circumvent any consequences of breaking his oath while still working in opposition to Frodo. But not only does his plan fail, he himself is sacrificed to see his oath fulfilled in full, carrying the ring into the fire where it will be out of Sauron's grasp forever. 
So certain utterances or statements of intent carry a binding power, both in the minds of those who make them and in reality. There are degrees of seriousness when it comes to oaths. Naming Eru Iluvatar as witness makes an oath inviolable, and swearing on some powerful object or in a formal ceremony tends to make oaths less flexible. But really, any serious statement made with the intention to bind the speaker can have oath-like consequence. How, then, does this work? In the traditional view of oaths, swearing only binds a person because the power they swear by will reinforce the oath with the consequences laid out beforehand. In Middle-earth, oaths only rarely name any kind of external power, and they don't always specify consequences, yet oaths and promises have a way of coming true even if a person later decides against following through with them, or if radical unforeseen changes make the oath's fulfillment very different from its initial conception. One extreme example of this, which I find both adorable and creepy, is the question of elven marriage. As described in Morgoth's Ring, elven marriage is an indissoluble bond that requires the consent of the couple involved, the exchange of blessings, the act of bodily union, and the naming of Eru. Elves are immortal, so their marriages are likewise supposed to last forever, but sometimes an elf suffers bodily death, and his or her spirit dwells in the halls of Mandos. Now, if this were men we were talking about, the marriage as such would no longer be binding since marriage is meant to be experienced between incarnates, and once a mortal dies, their soul leaves Arda and supposedly will not return. But elven souls do not leave Arda, and the Valar note that marriage resides ultimately in the will of the Fea. Therefore, while the marriage may be on hold while one party lacks a physical form, it may not be dissolved while both Fear remain in Arda. Moreover, except in extreme cases, the Valar must facilitate the reincarnation of slain elven souls. Tolkien went back and forth on what he thought re-embodiment might look like. At the time of writing this essay, he seemed to think that the elves might be reborn as children. They'd have the same soul, but get to experience life again from the very beginning, with a new set of formative experiences, even a new name, and not necessarily full memory of their first life. You might think that this would also hit reset on their marital status, but no. According to this essay, dead elves would be reborn into their new life, still married to their spouse. And fate would inevitably take care of the resumption of their marriage in due time. It follows, therefore, also that the dead will be reborn in such place and time that the meeting and recognition of the Sundered shall surely come to pass, and there shall be no hindrance to their marriage. It's not that the Valar would be capable of orchestrating such a thing, it's the nature of the couple's marital bond, undertaken by the will of the Fea and witnessed by Eru, that would warp reality such that the couple would meet and recognize each other, however many cycles of reincarnation they might go through during the course of history. The only exception, per this essay, would be if an elf willingly renounced any claim to return to embodied life, as outlined in the case of Finwë and Miriel. I include this not so much because it's a clear example of Tolkien's final thoughts on marriage or reincarnation, he goes on to have a variety of takes on both subjects. I include it because it is an exaggerated example of how oaths work. The naming of Eru ensures the marriage bond will be unbreakable. The will of the Fea is what's most important in the establishment of this bond, even in the case of marriage which by definition is a state that applies only to the incarnate. And finally, fate will guarantee that the bond is upheld even if one party is dropped into an entirely new body and life. It's not a question of the Valar summoning bees or something to punish philandering elves who break their marital bond. In its most extreme cases, to take an oath is to twist the course of history. This also demonstrates the differences between the elven and human approaches to oaths and to fate generally. Mortals can technically escape either the obligations of an oath or the consequences of breaking one by dying. Men walk around all the time, setting fate into motion with their declarations, and don't even stick around for the fallout, whereas elves are stuck in Arda until the end of its history. Every promise, oath, or emphatic statement binds them a little more tightly in their own fate until their free will can become all but negated. Examples that sound less like a bad rom-com premise than elven marriage does include Baron's oath to Thingol that when he sees him again he will have a Silmaril in his hand. What neither of them realize is that said hand, holding said Silmaril, will no longer be attached to Baron's body. Turin promises Meme that if he ever comes into money, he'll pay Meme for the death of his son. Meme later betrays Turin, and when Turin slays Glaurung and dies, paying Meme back is the farthest thing from his mind. Nevertheless, in those few hours by which he outlived Glaurung, Turin was arguably in possession of Glaurung's hoard, and by slaying Glaurung he allows Meme to claim it. But Meme has broken his own oath, so receiving Glaurung's treasure leads to his own death. And now that we've started talking about Turin and irony, we'd better get into curses. In the traditional formulation, an oath-taker calls a curse upon themselves if they should abandon their undertaking. 
This, like the name of any deity, is rarely included in the verbal formulation of most oaths in Middle-earth. However, where curses occur, typically one finds an oath operating in the background. In cases where there is a specific penalty specified by the oath, or in cases where another interested party adds or invokes a curse, that curse comes true if the oath is broken. A tidy example of this is Androg, one of Turin's companions, who swears to Meme the Petty Dwarf that he will not use a bow again after he shoots and kills Meme's son, and that if he does use a bow and arrow again, he will die by them. Androg doesn't love this idea, and eventually he takes archery back up. Shortly thereafter, he is hit by a poison dart in battle. Now, he is about to die from this in a classic example of a curse literally finding its mark, but then the elf Beleg intervenes and saves him. Curse averted, right? Yeah, no. Because Meme is so resentful of Beleg's interference that he decides to break his own oath to keep Baron Denwig secure. He sells the group out to a band of orcs, and Endrog gets another mortal wound in the resulting raid. Isildur curses the men of Dunharrow after they refuse to fight Sauron as they swore to do, to rest never until your oath is fulfilled, for this war will last through years uncounted, and you shall be summoned once again ere the end. Notably, Aragorn can't just revoke this curse or change the terms of the oath, not that he necessarily would if he could. He tells Gimli the oath that they broke was to fight against Sauron, and they must fight, therefore, if they are to fulfill it. So Aragorn can't just tell them to go away and let him and his allies take a shortcut unmolested, even though that might be less harrowing than what he actually goes through. Occasionally, though rarely, we see a curse come true ironically if the breaking of an oath was unavoidable or even morally demanded. A good example is Baragond, who goes rogue and keeps the, quote, loyal servants of Denethor from bringing the necessary materials for Denethor's premature pyre, even to the point of slaying his kinsmen in the Hallows, where violence is forbidden. In light of the circumstances, Aragorn commutes the death sentence that usually accompanies such oath-breaking to a mere termination of employment, and tells Baragond he must leave the guard of the Citadel and Minas Tirith, because he's going to be captain of Faramir's guard in Athelion. Aragorn is the king, so he has some authority to amend the law of his realm, but he can't just undo the consequences of a broken oath. What he can do is make it so that the consequence of that oath becomes a reward for Baragon's heroism. More ambiguous is the question of Merry and Eowyn's oath-breaking. Merry and Eowyn are both bound by fealty to Theoden, moreover both consider him to be as a father to them. By both accounts, they must obey him and protect him. Eowyn accepts the charge from Theoden to be his regent, and Merry is gently but firmly told to stay out of the Battle of Pelennor. Both of them disobey Theoden and ride secretly in his host, but in both cases their motivation is partly a desire to protect him. There's other motivations too. Merry somewhat pridefully resents being a baggage and doesn't want to be the only one of his friends who plays no role in the great deeds that are underway. Eowyn's been traumatized by living under the control of her stalker Grima, who has been gaslighting her into feeling contempt and shame for her own royal lineage. Spurned by Aragorn, her hope is to find a glorious death in battle. The penalty for Merry and Eowyn's broken oaths is that the oaths be broken. Having decided to disobey the man they consider both king and father, they find they cannot protect him, and so lose him. The punishment for putting their selfish desires over his will is that they achieve their desires, in the least satisfactory way possible. Merry does achieve his great deed, helping to slay the Witch King, but only after he's been overpowered by a terror so profound that he cowers in the mud rather than defending Theoden, ending any fantasies of valor he might have been harboring. The wound he suffers in his eagerness not to be left behind means that he is left behind, to his shame, when the Army of the West marches on Mordor. Eowyn does not fear death, indeed she's hoping to die. So she alone of the Rohirrim dares to face the Witch King, but instead of killing her, he is killed by her. Eowyn is thus denied the death she sought through the very act of seeking it. She resents her duties to protect her people, so her presence on the battlefield leads to more of them dying, as Eomer leads a reckless charge when he discovers her apparently lifeless body. She gets the renown she desired so fervently, but sees that this will neither win Aragorn's heart nor make her truly happy, and thus she is more depressed than ever until Faramir persuades her to direct her love and her ambition to more fruitful ends. The prime example of the interconnectedness of oaths and curses is the Oath of Feanor, which calls the everlasting darkness upon Feanor and his sons if they fail in their mission to punish any who steal or even touch their very sparkly Silmarils. It's unclear what he intended by this. My best guess is that Feanor meant to bind himself by the closest thing to permanent death he could imagine, banishment to the outer darkness, as eventually befalls Morgoth. 
It would be surprising, but not inconceivable, for him to alter his soul's destiny this way. On the other hand, Mandos speaks as if he expects Feanor's soul to arrive in his halls after his premature demise. A very possible solution to this is that death would not count as failing to achieve the oath. So Feanor is just biding his time in Mandos, and the second he gets reborn, it's on again. The Everlasting Darkness also seems like a fairly tame penalty, given all that goes on afterward. The Void doesn't seem to be hell, just nothingness, and you'd think that Mithras and Maglor at least would find Oblivion better than the prospect of murdering yet more cute babies ad infinitum. Especially since keeping their oath and even eventually fulfilling it doesn't seem to do the Feanorians much good. All but two lose their lives in pursuit of it, and when Mithras and Maglor finally get their hands on the remaining Silmarils, the jewels burn their now unclean flesh, and both are overcome by despair. Maglor, of course, has an inkling of what's going on here. If none can release us, then indeed the everlasting darkness shall be our lot, whether we keep our oath or break it. But less evil shall we do in the breaking. The Feanorians swore an oath of vengeance, hatred, violence, and greed. A corrupt evil oath, in the name of Eru. The oath is just as unbreakable as an elven wedding vow. It's going to be fulfilled, one way or another. The irony that the Feanorians don't see, at least at first, is that by swearing to do evil, they themselves will inexorably become creatures of evil, carrying their own darkness with them as long as their souls endure. The very vow they made included the curse they named as a penalty for breaking it, as a condition of its fulfillment. There was never any way out. Whether kept or broken, the Oath of Feanor is the curse of Feanor. The Noldor generally, even the ones who didn't personally take any oaths, talk about being under a curse, often called the Doom or Curse of Mandos. As the Noldor are departing Valinor, they encounter a dark figure, probably Mandos himself, who declares to the Noldor that if they do not turn back to seek pardon, they will suffer tremendously, that they will pay for shedding their kindred's blood with their own blood, that most of them will die and those that don't will dwindle, that through mistrust and betrayal everything the Noldor do will turn to evil, and that the wrath of the Valar is upon them. The way this tends to come up in the story is that the Valar, acting through Mandos, have put this curse on the Noldor as a punishment because they are angered by the Noldor's rebellion, but I don't think this is exactly the case. Are the Valar angry? Oh yeah. Do they levy punishments? For sure. But do they have the authority to change the destiny of the children of Eru through cursing them? Well, I'd say no. Most of the terrible things that Mandos foretells are unavoidable consequences of the Noldor's deeds. If no doom was proclaimed, most of the Noldor would still die horribly in Middle-earth. Of course they would, they're going to fight Morgoth on his home turf. It's also already clear that the mistrust and enmity among the Noldor is eventually going to tear their people apart. Of all that blood that they're about to shed, a good deal of it will end up indirectly benefiting the Sindar, who are the kindred of the Teleri. Elves who are not slain in battle inevitably dwindle under a great weariness, especially outside of Amon, where the Valar keep the land itself relatively free from Morgoth's taint. And we've already seen that the Oath of Feanor is itself a curse, one that the Valar have no authority to dissolve. In some of his latest writings, Tolkien points out that even shutting Valinor against the Noldor was kind of the Noldor's idea. As far as concerns the Noldor, they obtained precisely what they demanded, freedom from the sovereignty of Manwë, and therefore also from any protection or assistance by the Valar, or indeed any meddling with their affairs. The so-called Curse of Mandos is not an extra penalty imposed upon the Noldor by the Valar, so much as it is a foretelling, a warning, even a final chance to mitigate the consequences of their actions. To the Elves, who know how much more powerful the Valar are, it's hard to imagine all these bad things happening without them being willed in some way by the Valar. But in truth, the Valar are just pointing out that they can't undo the effects of the Noldor's decisions. The Valar can't truly curse the children of Eru, because to do so would interfere with their free will. Even Morgoth, who doesn't care about the rules and would love nothing more than to control the free will of elves and men, can only partially achieve this through constraint, deceit, or terror. Some of you are probably asking, but what about Turin? Wasn't he cursed by Morgoth? Turin is… a video in himself, but for the purposes of understanding the relationship between oaths and curses, I will just point out here that there is an oath involved that sets up the fate of Hurin's children. The oath Hurin gives Maeglin, of all people, that he will never speak of his time in Gondolin and keeping this oath sets off a whole web of strange coincidences. So to make an oath, which need not be formal or include any mention of a witness, enforcing power, or consequence, is to bind the terms of the oath into one's fate. It's almost impossible to predict the manner in which an oath will be satisfied. Curses incurred for breaking an oath can sometimes be blessings if breaking the oath was necessary. 
and sometimes the fulfillment of an oath is just another kind of curse. But you can be sure that the oath will be satisfied. This is kind of weird to contemplate because it's also clear that an oath taker can and indeed must still choose whether or not to abide by his oath. Some discussion of elven concepts of fate and free will becomes necessary here. I will try not to get too tangled up, so bear with me. The elves believe that a lot of events in history are preordained and fixed. This includes the unforeseen chances that come about as inadvertent decisions made by wills, a term here that is mostly applicable to the children of Eru. This is chance as used in the term chance meeting, and is in elvish thought a subset of fate. Gandalf decided to go to Bree on a particular day, not planning to run into Thorin Oakenshield, but that does not mean that this chance meeting was a result of free will. It was fated to come about, one way or another. Having encountered this chance, however, Gandalf's free will has scope to work. He can decide to distance himself from Thorin's quest, or he can decide to get involved with it in any number of ways, all presumably leading to different outcomes. The factor distinguishing events that are the result of truly free will and events that are destined, for lack of a better word, is pre-existing intent. To be a true act of will, a decision must be directed to a fully aware purpose. In Middle-earth generally, the intent with which an action was done largely determines whether it is considered good or evil, and what the consequences of it are. Celebrimbor made the elven rings to heal and renew the world, so his rings are on the whole considered good and achieve mostly good results. Sauron made the one ring to conquer and control the other rings, so his ring is considered very, very evil and leads to great suffering. Same action, different intent, different outcomes. We also know that purely internal intent is rarely all good or all bad, and that it's in flux. This is where oaths come in. Oaths in Middle-earth derive their power from being statements of fixed intent. Characters in Middle-earth have all kinds of fleeting thoughts, impressions, emotions, and ideas cross their minds. And while these intentions may govern their actions in the moment, they don't have the same kind of destiny-altering power that an oath does, even if said oath is just a simple statement made to an empty room. That's why when people swear in Middle-earth, they don't need to include any divine names or consequences. Their spoken intent is itself the authority that projects their will forward and shapes their fate. Tolkien likened this to the relationship between an author and his characters. An author is outside the story, and everything in the story ultimately comes from his imagination. He knows what's going to happen in the story, and he's made up the characters. But when he sits down to write a scene, he doesn't know in advance exactly what he's going to write even if he does know how he wants the scene to end. It often seemed to Tolkien as if his characters came to life and did things he hadn't planned, or that he discovered something about his imaginary world that previously he hadn't known, even though he knew the whole thing was his own creation. It's an imperfect metaphor, sure, because Eru is usually considered omniscient. Tolkien notes that the ultimate problem of free will in its relation to the foreknowledge of a designer was, of course, not resolved by the Eldar. But in explaining how oaths work, I think it's a useful framework. By speaking aloud a fixed intent at a given moment, an incarnate can write that intention into the network of predetermined events. Tolkien included a note that suggested outside Ea, or being, is the world sphere of aware purpose and will. It was outside Ea that the fixed conditions of the world were set by the Ainur during their great music. It is from outside Ea that Eru witnesses the evolving history of Arda and sometimes makes miraculous interventions. Through the medium of language, their particular gift and art, the children of Eru can exercise their authority to bring a given purpose into Ea, translating a potential reality into an actual one, albeit in ways they may not fully foresee. In his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien notes that one of the greatest and most underrated powers of language itself is its ability to allow the mind to imagine, or sub-create, a reality contrary to the one given. How powerful, how stimulating to the very faculty that produced it, was the invention of the adjective. No spell or incantation in fairy is more potent. The human mind is capable of forming mental images of things not actually present. Small wonder that spell means both a story told and a formula of power over living men. This is why physically speaking or writing your intent is a necessary component of oaths in contrast to mere moods or motives. Simple intentions are not part of Ea, but language, as Tolkien conceives it, requires a physical sign. It also requires a degree of understanding, informed consent, if you will, and specificity. Frodo both wants to ensure the ring's destruction and wants to go home, 
but he can't say both those things at once, that he will and will not take the ring. He also can't be bound by his willingness to take the ring if he doesn't say it out loud. He has to translate his incoherent impressions and longings into specific verbal concepts, decide which of many possible intents he wants to express, and then physically speak those words. And the second he does, Elrond jumps on him, because Elrond probably knows that a certain chain of events that had been hanging in the balance has just been resolved. An oath more or less ensures that your intent in the present will bind your future actions, even the unconscious ones that lead to faded chances. Those with authority over Ea, wizards, bombadil, ring bearers, and the like, can express that authority through language to achieve changes in Ea. The children of Eru primarily have authority over mm, their own will, so in a similar way they can express that authority through language to achieve changes in history. The oath is the medium through which Eru's children participate in the sub-creation of Arda's story. If you enjoyed this video, express that immaterial intent through the physical medium of hitting the like button, which will work within the parameters of the great algorithm to determine the fate of this video. Consider subscribing if you'd like to change your destiny to include more fated chance meetings with my content. Thank you so much for watching, and I'm not just saying that.